The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Preventing, Identifying, and Treating Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders uh, webinar se series. Uh, we're starting off with the overview of FASD and preventing alcohol-exposed pregnancies. My name is Anna Costales, and I am the Resource and Dissemination Manager here at AUCD. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to address a few logistical details. First, we'll provide a brief introduction of our speaker. Following the speaker's presentation, there'll be time for some questions. Because of the number of participants, your telephone lines will be muted throughout the call. However, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat box on the webinar console. You may send the chat to the whole audience or to the presenters only. We'll compile your questions throughout the webinar and address them at the end. Please note that we may not be able to address every question and may combine some questions. This entire webinar is being recorded and will be available on AUCD's website um, after three business days. There will also be a short five question evaluation survey at the close of the webinar. We invite you to provide feedback of the, on the webinar and also to provide suggestions for future topics. Uh, please join me in welcoming today's, today's speaker. David Deere is the director of the USED in Arkansas, Partners for Inclusive Communities, and the training director for the Arkansas Regional LEND Program. He is, a member, he is a member of the Mental and Reproductive Health FASD Practice Implement Implementation Center, where he's helping develop online FASD trainings for health professionals. He is also a co-author of the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders, Epidemiology, Diagnosis, Neurobiology, and Interventions. Um, in my, I'm sorry. There is also a module in the AUCD core cur curriculum. Um, I will now pass the mic over to David. David. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Anna. And good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're located. Uh, I do want to apologize for my voice. It's, uh, I know it's very raspy today. I've developed a chest cold, but um, you'll just have to bear with me on that today. Uh, let me begin by saying just a little bit about why I wanted to, to do this uh, series. Uh, we, there was, uh, last month, there was an article published in JAMA that um, noted that a prevalence rate for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders would be estimated to be at about one in 20 people. And the other thing that was really alarming that was part of that article is that less than 1% of the actual cases had been diagnosed. So what that tells us is there are a lot of cases, most of them are not diagnosed, we're uh, interacting with these individuals in a lot of different uh, social service systems. Uh, we know that on average, a uh, person with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome will, will cost the government more than $2 million over their lifetime. And there have been various studies. One found that about 17% of the kids in foster care uh, have FAS or FASD. And, uh, that uh, children, adolescents with FASD are 19 times more likely to be in the juvenile justice system than their typically developing peers. Uh, if you would advance the slide, please. So this um, is, I think, a very important topic to all of our AUCD network. I realize we have people from outside the network that are a part of this as, as well. Uh, we wanted to do this webinar to begin helping more people understand this condition. Uh, I firmly believe that our network is well positioned to be a national leader on developing understanding, awareness, and services for this, this population. Um, and I will say we have some of the 
national leaders in this uh, on this condition that are, are a part of our network. Um, and we're hoping to um, provide more resources for um, centers and people throughout the country. Uh, we're going to have a call next week to uh, begin organizing a learning community around FASD. Uh, as Anna said, I'm a part of a, uh, an initiative at the CDC to develop uh, curricula for various health professions. As you see on the slide, uh, there, we're focusing on family medicine, OBGYN, pediatrics, nurses, social workers, and medical assistants. And not only are we developing uh, training materials for these professions, we're working with the National Association to help uh, get the word out about the, these uh, online training opportunities. And you see at the bottom of this slide the uh, URL that you can go to if you'd like to take any of these um, online training modules. There is continuing education that's associated with it. There are currently two modules that are, are uh, available. There are three more that are in the pipeline that will be coming out a little later. The other thing that we're, we're trying to do with this project is, in addition to educating and developing awareness, is to actually begin to uh, make practice change at, uh, at the systems level. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, what we can do, particularly to prevent FASDs, and we can uh, implement some of those practices at the systems level. Next slide, please. So in the previous project that, that um, the CDC did, they were really focused on practice change, helping individuals to, to make changes in the way they uh, uh, conducted their practice. But um, uh, next slide, please. The current project is really focusing more on systems change, and that's uh, bringing about change at the uh, healthcare system or community uh, level. And we are working with uh, healthcare providers around the country to, to begin implementing evidence-based practices to help uh, prevent future cases of FASD. Uh, next slide, please. So over the, the three weeks, these are the topics that we will be covering. Uh, I'm covering today part one and part two, definitions and descriptions and preventing alcohol exposed pregnancies. Uh, two of my colleagues in this CDC project are going to join us next week. Uh, that's Lee Tenku and Dan Dabowski. And they will cover parts three and four, FASD characteristics, treatment and interventions and addressing stigma and barriers. And then on the third week, on the, the 22nd of March, uh, Lee Tenku and I will, will address uh, social work's role, which doesn't have to be limited to social work. We develop this because we are focused on getting materials out to social workers, but it really would be anyone that's wanting to help develop more uh, programs and uh, systems within, within the community and your state. Okay, next slide. So we'll begin by uh, defining what is FASD, our fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And our learning objectives for this unit will be defining uh, fetal alcohol syndrome or FAS, describing and identifying characteristics of prenatal alcohol exposure and uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD and we will describe how FASDs are diagnosed. Next slide. So FAS is a disorder that results from exposure to alcohol during pregnancy. When I, when I do uh, lectures on this, I typically get a question about what about the father's role. The father consuming alcohol can uh, play a part in this, but this is a condition that that it's the exposure to alcohol in utero 
that can result in an FASD. And this can cause abnormalities and deficits in an individual uh, involving growth, neurobehavioral uh, components, and facial characteristics. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> we now know that FAS is uh, significantly higher than we previously thought. I had mentioned the, the article that's published, and I do recommend you look at that. It was uh, just published last month in JAMA that uh, where they is, uh, estimate the rates to be between two and five percent. Next slide, please. So how do we diagnose this? Actually, there is not a uniformity uh, in the way we do this. There are several different uh, guidelines or criteria for making a diagnosis. They're all somewhat similar, but there are some slight differences in them. Uh, the CDC is promoting the one that's listed at the top, uh, clinical Diag guidelines for diagnosing uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But uh, you will see in different regions of the country, others of these that are used quite a bit. And I'll also mention the fourth bullet, the four digit diagnostic code. Uh, Susan Nasley, who is uh, part of the USAID in uh, Washington, uh, was one of the key developers of that. Uh, next slide, please. So using the CDC criteria, there are three areas in which we uh, will need to uh, see the person meet criteria. The first is uh, facial dysmorphia. The second are growth deficits. And the third is uh, central nervous system abnormalities. Now, I do want to point out that at this point, I'm talking about fetal alcohol syndrome. We'll talk about other conditions that fall under the FASD umbrella in, in a few minutes. Uh, and one thing that I uh, will mention before I get into looking at the physical effects is that um, one big issue is whether or not we have to confirm uh, maternal alcoholic uh, consumption. Uh, for a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome that isn't required, uh, for some of the other conditions, uh, it is. And I'll talk about that a little more later. So uh, one of the more obvious things for the, the full condition fetal alcohol syndrome are uh, differences in facial features. Uh, there are some others that we typically see, but the three that we really focus in on uh, is the short palpebral fissure, that means a small, eye opening, uh, an indistinct filtrum, which is the, the ridge uh, between the nose and, and the upper lip, and then a thin upper lip or a, a vermilion uh, border. And I will say that this child that you see in this picture is um, a classic case. Uh, a lot of times the features are not as obvious as they are in, in this case. Okay, next slide. But um, we also know that FAS is only the tip of the iceberg. And as the picture is demonstrating, the part above the surface or the surface or the part that's most obvious, FAS is a fraction of the, the totality of FASD. Okay, next slide. And this slide is demonstrating that FASD is really a, an umbrella term that uh, covers a number of different conditions. FASD is not a diagnosis. It's a, a dis description of the collection of diagnoses that range from partial uh, fetal alcohol syndrome to fetal alcohol syndrome alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, and alcohol-related birth defects. And then uh, from the DSM-5, we have another condition that's neurodevelopmental disorder associated 
with prenatal alcohol exposure or NDPAE. One thing I want to point out about NDPAE is that that is not a, a billable code. Uh, it is uh, listed in the, the latter pages of the DSM and is listed as a condition that warrants further study. They do give a diagnostic code, but um, uh, in most cases, we have trouble getting uh, payment for that code. But in a moment, I'll talk about an alternative code that can be used to that. Okay, next slide, please. So in looking at the spectrum of uh, FASD, we have talked about uh, FAS and you can have uh, confirmed maternal exposure or but you don't have to for that that condition. Um, the assumption is if all the features are present then mom uh, consumed alcohol and there are several reasons it's often difficult to get confirmation. Uh, sometimes moms are reluctant to admit to, to using alcohol during pregnancy. Uh, sometimes mom is not around. We're, we're seeing a foster child and mom may be in another state. I will say, I mentioned though that confirmation doesn't have to come from the mother for the con conditions that require uh, confirmation of uh, alcohol use. That can come from another family member, uh, medical records, uh, can come from a variety of sources. So with PFAS or partial FAS, uh, in this, uh, for that condition, you have the uh, facial features and one of the other uh, components, but not all three. For alcohol-related birth defects, that involves um, other organs or systems in addition to the central nervous system. And then ARND or alcohol related neurodevelopmental disorder um, does not have to have the facial features. You do have to have confirmed exposure to alcohol in utero. And then um, either uh, central nervous system abnormality or cognitive uh, abnormalities. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that NDPAE is not, uh, in most cases, is not a billable code. Uh, within the section under uh, developmental disorders, there is the option for a diagnosis of other specified neurodevelopmental disorder, developmental disorder associated with prenatal, prenatal alcohol exposure sounds almost the same as, as the one that is the condition for further study, but this one is billable. So if any of you that are using the DSM-5, I would encourage you to use uh, the code for the other specified neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, I think you'll have a better success with uh, getting services then, payment for services for the, for the individual. Okay, next slide. Um, I won't read all of this, this slide. Uh, there's a lot here. We could spend quite a bit of time on it. I just want to point out that all these different areas of the brain can be affected by prenatal alcohol exposure. And a lot of that depends on when the exposure happens and what part of the brain is developing at that time. <clears throat> and so there can be deficits in in any or all of these areas. And so you see very different presentations with uh, FASDs because you may have a different combination of areas that are affected and even the, the level of impact on that part of the brain. Okay, next slide. I will just mention that uh, overall though, we know that uh, FASDs are the largest preventable cause of uh, intellectual disabilities. And the key thing to, to notice is that it is preventable. 
uh, unlike a lot of the other causes of developmental disabilities, this is one that we know how to prevent, but it's complex in, in how to actually, in practicality, make that happen. Um, I realize that for those of you that are in the AUCD network, uh, interprofessional care is at the heart of what we do. So it probably wouldn't be surprising to see us recommending having an interprofessional team to make a the assessment uh, that would be part of the diagnosis. Okay, next slide. And also we would want an interprofessional team uh, that's part of the, the management and support for the individual. Uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, for those of you that are wanting more of an introduction into interprofessional care, uh, I will uh, direct you to a site that has uh, modules that, that cover that as well. Okay, next slide. Um, for those of you that are doing developmental assessments, uh, basically what we're looking for with uh, someone where we're trying to assess for an FASD is to do a comprehensive assessment looking at all the different uh, various domains of, of development. Okay, next slide. One thing I would like to point out is that very often uh, this is misdiagnosed. A lot of those, that other 99% of the, the people that actually have FASD very often will have one of the diagnoses that you see listed here. Uh, some of them may not have a DSM diagnosis. They may just be labeled as emotionally disturbed. A lot of them we see in, in alternative learning environments in school. And we spend a lot of time in education trying to figure out how do we uh, deal with the behaviors of, of these students. And a lot of times uh, they really are undiagnosed cases of uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Okay, next slide. And so what we've covered thus far, we know that um, the CDC diagnostic criteria uh, require us to document uh, growth deficits. And the standard we're looking for here is uh, at or below the 10th percentile for, for growth, either in height or weight. Uh, we also are looking for neurobehavioral abnormalities and facial abnormalities. And that's for the full FASD diagnosis. We know that uh, FAS is only the tip of the iceberg. Probably less than 10% of the cases of an FASD will be full-blown FAS. And FASD is the descriptive term. Uh, it's not a diagnosis, but it covers the range of diagnoses. And we also uh, talked about an interprofessional team working together for an assessment and to address the client's needs uh, would be our recommendation. Okay, next slide. I know we've moved through that fairly quickly and in subsequent uh, presentations uh, in this series, we'll get more into exactly what does it look like uh, practically, pragmatically, what are the, the uh, challenges for daily living and, and behaviorally for folks with an FASD. But now we're going to spend a few minutes looking at how do we uh, prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies. Okay. And our objectives here are to uh, look a little bit of, at the prevalence of alcohol use among women in the United States, to describe ways to help clients reduce or quit alcohol use, and to uh, use current evidence-based practices to prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancies. And we'll talk about two or three different uh, practices that can be used. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> we know that one thing that's really missing is that professionals 
uh, don't always understand the impact of prenatal alcohol exposure, and they may not take all the uh, effective steps toward preventing exposure. And what we're wanting to do um, with this project is to help uh, health professionals to be much better informed and to uh, step up and take a role in preventing those cases, okay? We, uh, we know that um, alcohol use is, is very common in the United States. We also know that uh, almost half of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. A few years ago, the rate was at half. We've made a little progress. We're down, now down to 45% of the pregnancies are unplanned. And hang on to that thought because uh, we're going to talk in just a few minutes about how that complicates uh, prevention of pregnancies. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, stopping alcohol use when you find out you're pregnant. We also know that 7.3% uh, of U.S. women are at risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy, uh, and that three in four women who want to get pregnant as soon as possible report drinking alcohol. Okay, next slide. Uh, a group in Missouri did a study on uh, risk for alcohol use after confirmation of pregnancy. And they found three uh, groups that tended to be at, at high risk. And those are people that were uh, experiencing intimate partner violence, uh, women who were using tobacco, and women who were using other drugs. We know these are not the only uh, groups that use alcohol during pregnancy, but these three groups are at much higher risk. Okay, next slide. This slide is, is a fairly busy one, but it's, it's showing what is happening developmentally uh, during uh, pregnancy. And you, uh, for each of these different systems that are listed, uh, you'll see the darker areas when the, the um, fundamental development is happening. But then you also see that development continues as the bar gets lighter. Uh, it's just not as critical a period. And you'll notice the first thing out of all these that, that's beginning to develop is the central nervous system. That's the brain and the spinal cord. And it's, it's beginning in week three of pregnancy. And so what we know about um, women who are, are um, become pregnant is very, very few of them know week three that they're pregnant. Uh, only the ones who are trying really, really hard to, to uh, achieve pregnancy might know at that point. So that means that um, the fetus is already, the brain is already developing uh, well before most women find out that they're pregnant, which means that uh, we, we really need to get the message out that if you might become pregnant, you need to refrain from using alcohol. And that's really the more complicated part of our, our challenge. Although we, we know that many health professionals still tell women that it's okay to, to drink when, when they are pregnant. And um, we, we know that um, really all the health professional organizations and the um, governmental uh, organizations that deal with, with reproductive health all agree that no alcohol is recommended at any point during pregnancy. Okay, next slide. Um, one thing that makes this sort of a challenging condition to, to wrap our arms around is that not every woman who drinks or even drinks heavily will have a child with an FASD. Uh, there are a number of factors that can go into this, a number of risk and, and protective factors. You see on this slide a number of things that can serve as, as protective factors. Uh, basically, the healthier a woman is, the, the uh, better her odds are of uh, 
having an alcohol exposed pregnancy that that doesn't result in an FASD. But it's really a, a risky issue to to drink when you're pregnant and and hope that uh, your child will not be one of the ones affected. Okay, next slide. So when we're counseling women regarding alcohol use during pregnancy, we need to know that a lot of them get uh, misinformation. Uh, there are a number of myths that uh, circulate, such as it's okay to drink in the third trimester, uh, drinking wine rather than beer or hard liquor is okay. Sometimes people hear the messages that uh, wine has some health benefits and in spite of those health benefits for uh, an individual, uh, it they don't have health benefits for uh, a developing fetus. And so all types of alcohol are, uh, can be detrimental. And then finally, that um, it's okay to drink when you're, you're breastfeeding. A lot of people are advised to have a glass of wine when they're breastfeeding. It helps them relax, helps their milk come down. But we now know that um, if a woman is consuming alcohol, that, that uh, their, her baby is getting the same level of alcohol that is in her uh, bloodstream, uh, getting that in the breast milk. So that's not recommended either. Okay, next slide. So uh, what we are recommending is uh, implementing universal screening. And that's the uh, systems change that we're, we're encouraging uh, systems to make is uh, to universally screen for alcohol use. Uh, we know that uh, alcohol use is common among women of reproductive age and that risky alcohol use can be associated with uh, increasing experiencing uh, intimate partner violence, alcohol exposed pregnancies, unintended pregnancies, and physical health problems. We know that screening and brief counseling are effective at reducing risky alcohol use and alcohol exposed pregnancies. And we know that screening alone can make a difference in alcohol use. Okay, next slide. So uh, universal screening is the first step in prevention. Uh, and what we're talking about is using a consistently using a validated set of questions to identify drinking patterns and to determine the need for further steps. I want to point out that what we're talking about is not a diagnosis of a uh, substance use disorder, but uh, the screening can help determine the next steps. And um, what we're talking about is different from uh, screening for um, uh, uh, substance use disorder, we're, we're really talking about screening for risky use and possibly the risk of an alcohol exposed pregnancy. And so the recommendation is screening all women of reproductive age uh, and screening every woman every time. And um, to realize that any alcohol use during pregnancy would be considered at risk. It, being at risk would be different if you're not pregnant. Uh, the stand threshold would be uh, considerably higher, but any alcohol use during pregnancy is considered at risk. Okay, next slide. Um, let me also point out that we would recommend screening not only in healthcare settings, uh, not only when women are coming in for physical exams, but uh, they can be used in all sorts of settings. If you are you have a, um, a program that's teaching parenting skills or any sort of program where you, you have particularly women of reproductive age, uh, screening for alcohol use can be an effective way to help prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies. 
Sometimes clinicians express discomfort with screening for alcohol. Uh, sometimes they may say, I really don't have enough knowledge or experience. And they may be concerned that questions about uh, drinking might be off offensive to their patients. But we also know that um, if a person routinely uses and practices uh, administering screenings, that pretty quickly they become comfortable with it. And if they use a non-judgmental approach in delivery of the questions, it's really not um, offensive to the patients. So we encourage people to be approachable and ask all clients uh, the screening questions and not just ones that you might determine might be at risk. Okay. One thing that's important in um, talking with women about use, if you're screening and talking about uh, how many drinks a woman is having, one thing that's important is to establish what is a, a drink, what is a standard uh, drink. This slide shows the, the different um, amounts of the various types of alcohol that would be considered a, a drink. And um, you see that includes a range. You're really concerned with how many grams of alcohol the person is, is consuming. Okay, next slide. And this talks about for uh, non-pregnant women, the risky drinking level would be three or more drinks in a 24 hour period and seven or more drinks in a week. And you see that it's a little higher for men. Uh, that's not because we're giving men a break, it's because uh, men tend to be larger and uh, it would take more drinks to achieve the same level of uh, blood alcohol content. And we know that any alcohol use is risky for women who are pregnant, could become pregnant, or plan to become pregnant, or if the individual has a uh, condition or they're taking medication where it's not advisable. Uh, it's also uh, considered risky use. Any alcohol is considered risky for individuals under 21 or people that uh, have a problem with alcohol use. Okay, next slide. There are a number of different screening instruments that can be used. Uh, you see that the NIAAA has a single question they advocate. Uh, how many times in the past year have you had four more drinks uh, in a day? That would be for, for women. Uh, you also see the audit that's listed at the right side of the screen that has three questions that uh, are used for, for their screen. And the audit is one that's, that's very commonly used. It's one that the CDC is um, promoting being used. Okay. We recommend that um, all women are screened for alcohol use uh, and ask specifically about alcohol use. And you probably would want to examine further if other drug use is present. We know that most people who are using uh, street drugs also use alcohol. Uh, we really recommend you embed this in a general health screening so it's part of the, the uh, battery of questions that you'd be asking and to present questions in a non-judgmental manner to promote open communication. Uh, and in addition to the specific screening questions, ask open-ended questions and to be uh, specific. And you may want to use uh, direct literal language. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides, okay? So when uh, screening indicates risky drinking, then we um, would move to what we call a brief intervention. And that would begin by asking the individual about the risk they see associated with drinking too much. And as they're talking about that, uh, we listen for pro-change talk. Uh, motivation, indications of motivations they might have to change. Uh, 
we would summarize the feelings, both positively, positive and negative feelings about making that behavioral change, discuss with the individual options, and review any plans for change. And uh, if there are plans for change, we certainly would recommend following up on, on future visits on, on how that is going. And um, we also want to point out that these interventions that we're describing may need to be modified for women who ha themselves have an FASD or other developmental disability to improve success. In just a moment, I'll talk about some of those uh, adaptations we, we might make. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, if you're wanting to get more information about alcohol screening and brief intervention, and I'll mention that a brief intervention, uh, this whole process, if you go through with a brief intervention, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it's uh, usually not a lengthy process that we're talking about. Uh, the CDC has uh, a planning and implementation uh, guide for screening and brief intervention. Uh, that's free of charge from the CDC. Okay, next slide. This goes into a little more detail. It's uh, really uh, reviewing what we talked about just a moment ago about uh, screening and brief intervention. Uh, and the, there are different uh, um, details that different people um, teach and, and promote in doing a screening and brief intervention. But the basic steps uh, tend to be in, involved in all of those. And that's raising the subject, providing feedback, enhancing motivation, and negotiating a plan. <clears throat> and all of them would use the um, core skills of motivational interviewing that um, follow the acronym ORS, open-ended questions, affirmations, which encourage and support their positive behavior changes, reflective listening, and summarizing the content to let the individual you understand their perspective and are encouraging uh, them taking charge of, of their uh, plan of change. Okay. Another um, uh, program for uh, preventing alcohol-exposed pregnancies is a curriculum called Choices. Uh, this was funded by the CDC, and they provide the curriculum free of charge. This uh, involves a two to four session of um, education. Uh, it can be used in a primary care or specialty care setting, or it can be used uh, with uh, college age students. And basically it's um, preventing, uh, presenting uh, options for preventing an alcohol exposed pregnancy. And that's by either reducing or stopping drinking, using contraception or both. Okay, next slide. Um, Another program that um, is, is more involved but is very effective, uh, both that this program can both prevent um, alcohol exposed pregnancies, but also provide support to parents uh, who may have a child with an FASD, may have an FASD themselves, and it's an evidence-based home visitation case management intervention. Uh, it comes out of the University of Washington and is the parent-child assistance program. Uh, the case manager works, uh, one case manager works with 16 families for three years. They do home visits twice a month. They connect families with services and help them uh, with goal setting and thereby provide support and, and coaching. And they serve as role models for the, for the families, okay? Uh, one big issue that we hear a lot of times is, well, we, we don't do screening and brief intervention because um, we can't bill for it. Well, 
now uh, it is possible to, to bill for screening and brief intervention. Uh, and uh, this is um, showing uh, what what's involved in in doing that. You can get the guidelines at the URL that's at the bottom of this slide uh, from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. <coughs> um, and in some cases, uh, uh, carriers will not pay for something that's billed as a screening and brief intervention. In that case, you can use an evaluation and management code that can be used for a time-based one-on-one -on -one counseling and or coordination of care. And screening and brief intervention falls under that definition. And uh, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have um, uh, a guide to uh, billing under under that code. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> this talks about some of the adaptations we may need to make if we have an individual with a uh, an intellectual disability, and specifically if there are women with an FASD, uh, they might need some of these uh, adaptations. We know that uh, screening questions may be misinterpreted by someone who is uh, literal in their thinking. And because of that, the assessment of risk might not be accurate. We also know that the brief interventions we do is a verbal dialogue, and it is really based on the individual's uh, understanding to uh, about the process and making behavior change. Uh, so it, while it works with many, many women, it doesn't work with, with all women. Okay, next slide. So um, we also know that individuals with FASD tend to have difficulty with verbal receptive language processing. And this, this can be across the intellectual span. It, it's one of the things that really makes life difficult for people with FASD. Uh, often their, their expressive language is far more advanced than their receptive language. So people think they're understanding far more than they do. And that's often the case with FASD. Okay, next slide. Um, so in, in this section, we uh, learned that 7.3% of women are at risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy, that alcohol can af affect the fetus at any point during development. A universal alcohol screen for all women of reproductive age is crucial. And there are evidence-based interventions such as uh, screening and brief intervention choices and the uh, uh, parent-child program that came out of the University of Washington. These can help prevent, reduce, or stop risky alcohol use and therefore prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancies. And we know that um, prevention and intervention strategies may need to be adapted for individuals living with an FASD. And this is one reason I really want to get uh, our USEDs, our LENS involved in this topic. We are experts in how to make those adaptations, how to uh, modify things for people with intellectual disabilities. And we really can be a service to people that are working in this field that may not have that same level of expertise that, that we do. Uh, next slide. This slide is just uh, letting you know about another resource for um, online training. That's the CatalystLearningCenter.com. Uh, there are different online uh, modules for various health professionals. Uh, there's one for uh, families that are living with a, a, a child with FAS or FASD. Uh, 
if you're interested in, in getting additional training, it's, it's a good place to, to check out along with the, the CDC's uh, web page that I, I mentioned at, at the beginning. Okay, next slide. And in this slide, I wanted to acknowledge the, all the, the group that helped to develop the slides that are here today. Uh, they not only developed the slides, they have gone through uh, the approval process at the CDC refining these things. Uh, these slides can be available for, for you to use. One of the things we're wanting to do is uh, a number of you that are on the call have already signed up to be uh, social work FASD champions. And we're wanting to recruit additional champions. Our goal is to have one in every state and uh, we will be providing a number of resources for you to use in doing that. We'll talk more about the role of champions in the last slide, but uh, just briefly, champions can, can do in-person trainings. You can promote people going to the, the CDC training site. And the other thing we're, we're asking champions to do is help us find uh, health systems that are willing to implement practice change uh, to help prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies. Last thing I'll say before we take questions is that um, about half the slides that we're covering in these three sessions were in the one for today. We looked at trying to break this up differently, but it just didn't make sense to do it any other way. So I moved pretty quickly and didn't allow a lot of time for questions. Uh, if there are questions that you have that you we don't uh, deal with in the next few minutes, uh, feel free to email them to me or to save them and, and bring them up in the, the next two sessions. Uh, we should have a good bit more time in, in those. So with that, I will stop and uh, open it up for questions. Okay, great. We have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, I uh, love the idea of universal screening. If they are pregnant and have been using substances, what do we tell them to do besides stop? What if damage has already been done? Where do we refer to for, for further testing and subsequent child therapy after the child is born? Um, do physicians know of these resources? And the earlier identified, the better the outcome. Well, wow, there's a lot packed in that question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's a great question. Uh, let me let me again begin by talking about the uh, is it enough to tell them to stop? In a lot of cases, it is. Uh, if someone has an addiction, it is definitely not enough, and a brief intervention is not enough. And I failed to mention that the other step to that for the people where it's indicated, if it's uh, beyond at risk drinking, that we would refer for treatment, and we would turn them over to the professionals that. Uh, can help people uh, get clean and make the, the life changes uh, to um, move away from, from uh, their addictions. Um, and so part of that is knowing who is in your area that uh, is available to do that. Uh, the, uh, there is a uh, locator for services that the CDC has that um, where you can, or is it SAMHSA? I'll have to look that up. It may be SAMHSA that has the, I think it is, that has the locator for services in each, uh, each region or state. Unfortunately, most of our states don't have enough capacity to serve everyone that not only needs services, but even the people that are asking for treatment. Uh, it's it's really a sad state of affairs, but uh, that's what we would do with people that aren't able to just stop when when they're told that you know that's putting your your developing child at risk. Another thing I want to say about that is uh, we know that even low levels of drinking that might not result in an FASD can cause uh, changes in in the the baby where they don't uh, feed as well, they don't uh, get into a routine of, of sleep and, and feeding, they don't habituate as well. So even low levels of drinking that don't result in an FASD can be 
uh, detrimental to the child. Um, so, and, and I love your, your comment about early intervention. Absolutely. The earlier, the better. Uh, unfortunately, we can't reverse the effects of the alcohol exposure, uh, but we, we know that brains are very plastic and with, um, good inter early interventions, we can create neuro new neural pathways that help the brain to function better. So um, we certainly would want to do that. Uh, as far as where to refer, uh, you know, one place I would start, if you're not part of the AUCD network, I would go to AUCD.org and there they'll have a directory for every you said in, in your state and I would go to them and ask. And even if the you said is not knowledgeable about FASD, they will be knowledgeable about how to support people with the different functional challenges that they have. And I may have missed a part of that uh, question. If so, let me know and I'll try to try to get to that. It's a good question. No, I think you got all of it. Um, okay. We have a bunch of questions and I know we're not gonna be able to answer them all. Um, so uh, if if your question is pressing and we don't answer it at the end of this webinar, um, David uh, said that you can email him and I'll also put this in the chat box. It's dear, D-E-E-R-E -E -E, at U-A-R-K dot E-D-U. But I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so do champions have to be social workers? Well, uh, no, they don't have to be. Uh, actually, I think all of the the six uh, uh, health professionals that the six different fields of health professions that uh, we listed at the beginning have their own champions. Uh, some of them have uh, uh, identified one for each region of the country. Uh, we're really trying to get one in each state. But uh, anyone that would help us with this work, uh, absolutely uh, let me know who you are and that you want to be involved. And if you're not a social worker, we'll find a place for you to help make a difference. Uh, the other thing we will be letting you know in the not too distant future about some activities that a number of us in our network are going to be doing to help uh, support and resource people that are interested in working in this, this area, whether or not you're called a champion. Great. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, someone asked, uh, would SBIRT be a good screening and brief intervention tool? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, screening, uh, SBIRT, S-B-I-R-T is screening, brief intervention, and referral for, for treatment. And that's really what we're advocating. The tool that you use to do that uh, really doesn't make a lot of difference as long as you have a consistent tool that you're, you're using. And then when indicated, do the brief intervention. And further, if you have those people that need additional support, uh, then referring for treatment. Great. Okay, we have for another one? Yeah, sure. Um... I'm just trying to pick, uh, there's a bunch. Um, I've seen recent studies that show that percentage of alcohol exposed pregnancies are underestimated. Do you agree with this? Oh, absolutely they are. Um, we, we do know that um, in the study that was funded by the NIH, there were actually four separate studies in four different regions of the country. And they found that uh, only one in 111 cases of an FASD were actually diagnosed. So yes, they are very much under recognized. And that's part of the reason we have trouble getting attention to this, this issue is that we don't have the data to say we have, uh, you know, we had 5,000 kids born in our state last month, with, uh, last year with an FASD. 
Well, I'm going to actually make that the last question since we have less than a minute left. And um, I put David's uh, email address in the chat box. I also put the link to our directory. I'm going to forward the questions on to David that were an answer. There's just a few of them. Um, I will be making the slides available uh, probably right after this webinar and the handouts. They'll be available on the event page. And I will also email all registrants. Um, but I would like to thank David for an awesome presentation, uh, jam-packed with information. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the series. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are going to, um, there's a short five question survey that will pop up on your screen at the end. Um, we invite you to uh, give us feedback on this particular topic and um, give suggestions for future topics. Thanks again, David, and thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat>